As president of the American Bar Association, I'm honored to present the 2020 ABA Silver Gavel Awards. These prestigious awards recognize outstanding efforts in media and the arts to foster the American public's understanding of law. They are among our association's most important and enduring annual recognitions. The ABA usually presents these awards in person at the National Press Club in Washington, DC. This is the first ever virtual presentation of these awards. The awards were first presented in 1958 under the visionary leadership of then ABA President Charles Ryan, who also established the National Commemoration Law Day. Over the years, our extraordinary awardees have addressed many matters of law and justice. As in the case this year, many have focused on compelling issues of criminal justice. I will highlight just a few from the past. From the Silver Gavel Awards first year, Sidney Lumet's classic jury room drama, 12 Angry Men, starring Henry Fonda, who played juror number eight. And in most recent years, the 2012's The Central Park Five by documentarians Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon. NYU law professor Barry Friedman's acclaimed 2017 book, Unwarranted, Policing Without Permission. And finally, last year's Asbury Park Press's newspaper series, Protecting the Shield. Please visit Ambar dot org slash gavel awards to learn more about these and other award-winning programs and, and publications. For 2020, the ABA is awarding six silver gavels and five honorable mentions in the categories of books, commentaries, documentaries, drama and literature, newspapers, radio, and television. Sharon Stern Gerstman, Chair of the ABA Standing Committee on Gavel Awards will assist me in introducing the award winners and highlighting the outstanding contributions they have made to foster the American public's understanding of law. We will begin with the honorable mention citations. Thank you, Judy. I am pleased to highlight the five honorable mentions. First, honorable mention for books. In No Visible Bruises, author Rachel Louise Snyder aims to show what domestic violence looks like from the inside out. To accomplish this, she tells heartbreaking stories of victims and their families, as well as insightful accounts of convicted abusers. Snyder adopts the common term domestic violence, but persuasively argues that a far more accurate term is intimate partner terrorism. An exemplar of literary journalism, the book showcases the author's exceptional storytelling skills. She writes with tremendous passion and compassion about domestic violence and its most tragic consequence, domestic violence homicide. No Visible Bruises urges actors inside and outside of the legal system to seek and follow a path towards systemic change and innovative yet actionable solutions. There are two honorable mention documentaries. First, Alternative Facts tells a little known backstory that led tragically and shamefully to the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. It shows how wartime hysteria and racial animus combined to generate an outright fabrication that Japanese Americans were a national security threat to the United States. The result were the now notorious Executive Order 9066 and Public Law 503, upheld by the Supreme Court in 1944 in Korematsu. But as the documentary relates, the story does not end there. Some 40 years later, determined lawyers and an independent researcher succeeded in getting the Supreme Court to vacate its wartime ruling. Ultimately, the documentary is a compelling case study in how to help bend the law back towards truth and why this is too often necessary. Second, the documentary True Justice 
truly does justice to its indefatigable and inspiring subject, acclaimed civil rights advocate, Brian Stevenson. Interviews with associates, family members, and clients offer insights into Stevenson, but the filmmakers wisely let him tell his own story simply and eloquently. Stevenson remains hopeful about our nation's capacity to live up to our commitments to the rule of law and equal justice. The path lies through truth and reconciliation. At the end of the documentary, he asserts, I think there's something better waiting for us in this country than another century of conflict and tension and burden because we won't face the legacy of the past. The honorable mention for radio is the podcast Broken Justice about the public defender system in Missouri and what it tells us about justice in America. It examines the consequences of severe underfunding of the system. In Missouri, each public defender is assigned well over 100 clients. Broken Justice offers a revealing look into the shortcomings of this essential component of our adversarial legal system and what those shortcomings suggest about the state of criminal justice in the United States. Our final honorable mention is the feeling of being watched. This PBS POV television documentary is a personal account by intrepid Algerian American journalist, Asia Bundawi. She exposes the effects on herself, on her family, and on her Muslim American community in the Chicago suburb of Bridgeview of being under government surveillance and suspicion. Seeking to understand this FBI investigation, the filmmaker files requests under the Freedom of Information Act. By producing this powerful and unsettling film, Bodawi seeks in her own concluding words to make sure that those who do the watching are also being watched. To read committee commentaries and interviews with honorable mention awardees, please see the accompanying program booklet at ambar.org slash gavel awards. I'm now pleased to present the following 2020 ABA gavel award honorable mentions. First in the category of books, No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. Bloomsbury Publishing, Rachel Louise Snyder, author. For documentaries, Alternative Facts, The Lies of Executive Order 9066, JJML Productions, LLC, John Osaki, Director, Producer, and Editor, and Lauren Kawana, Consulting Producer. And to True Justice, Brian Stevenson's Fight for Equality, HBO and Cunhart Films, George Cunhart, Peter Cunhart, and Teddy Cunhart, directors and producers, and Maya Mama, editor and producer. For radio, Broken Justice, PBS NewsHour, Amna Nawaz, host, Frank Carlson, reporter, Vika Aronson, podcast producer, and Erica R. Hendry and Emily Carpo, editors. And finally, in the category of television, the feeling of being watched, POV, American Documentary and Multitude Films, Asia Bundawi, director and producer, Jessica Devaney, producer, Rabab Haj Yaya, editor, Shuling Young, Director of Photography, Justine Nagan and Chris White, Executive Producers. And now let's move on to our six Silver Gavel Award winners. First in books, in charged, author Emily Bazelon perceptively probes the decisive role of prosecutors in our criminal justice system. She highlights a new movement of reform-oriented DAs 
for adopting significant changes to end mass incarceration and achieve a greater measure of justice. This illuminating book is a must read for those who want to understand the power of their local DAs and learn about the burgeoning reform movement to transform prosecutors' offices throughout the country. We will now hear from Emily Bazelon. She talks about the title and subtitle of her book and who Kevin and Nora Jackson are. Charged was the idea of a friend of mine. I really liked it because it both has a meaning from criminal justice, the idea of criminal charges, but it also conveys this meaning of urgency, of a kind of electric current, um, and I think of importance. And I really liked that um, play on words. The subtitle of the book is The New Movement to Transform American Prosecution and End Mass Incarceration. I uh, insisted on all the those words because I wanted to get across the idea that prosecutors in America have really driven mass incarceration by in many instances over punishing people. At the same time, as I started working on my book, a movement arose to change all of that. And it really bubbled up from communities that are most affected by overpunishment. Communities of color, low income, communities in cities. Nora Jackson and Kevin are two people whose lives were deeply affected by criminal justice in two different ways that I wanted to illustrate. Nora's story is one that I see about being, about the abuse of a prosecutor's power. Nora was charged with the murder of her mother, which is a terrible crime to be charged for, and convicted even though the DNA and her evidence pointed away from her and actually excluded her from the crime scene. Kevin saw a gun lying on a table. It wasn't his gun, but he picked it up in a kind of rash teenage moment to help out his friend because he knew that his friend had a criminal record and would be much more severely punished. Kevin ends up with very serious felony charges because of New York's gun laws, but then receives a second chance from the prosecutor in Brooklyn, Eric Gonzalez, who was elected as a progressive reformer. And so I told his story to both show that a kind of garden variety event in a teenager's life can really um, put them at risk, but also how much it can mean to somebody like that if a prosecutor thinks about mercy as well as justice. The subject of charge is so important to me. I hope I was able to do some justice to it. I think when Americans have to look close up at how the criminal justice system works, they can see how deep the injustices go. And I hope that's where the political will comes to change so much of what's wrong inside it. The 2020's Silver Gavel Award for Books goes to Charged, the new movement to transform American prosecution and end mass incarceration, Penguin Random House, Accepting the Silver Gavel is Emily Bazelon, author. Thank you, Judy Perry Martinez, and thank you to the American Bar Association for this award, which I could not be more thrilled and honored to receive. I also want to thank my editor, Andy Ward, and my agent, Elise Cheney, two people for whom I have great respect and admiration and gratitude. And I wanna thank my husband, Paul, and my sons, Eli and Simon, for listening with patience and sometimes even interest to many stories about people caught up in the criminal justice system. I'm thinking about those people tonight, especially because of the risk of the coronavirus. And I hope this is a moment that causes America to rethink this vast system of punishment we've built, which is putting so many people at risk and really threatening to rip apart communities across the country. I think that the evidence in my book shows that there are better ways to keep us all safe. And I hope that uh, this is a moment for exploring deep change. Thank you so much. For commentary, St. Louis Post-Dispatch columnist Tony Messenger shines a light on modern day de facto debtor's prison scheme operating in rural Missouri courtrooms. Messenger clearly explains the often arcane legal procedures and then connects them to costs and consequences for the real people affected. As he makes abundantly clear, Missouri's debtor prisons are part of a greater epidemic, 
the pervasive criminalization of poverty that afflicts not just the Show Me State, but other states throughout the nation. Tony Messenger explains how the series started and why the silver gavel is so meaningful. The series actually started sort of organically in 2017. Uh, that's when I first wrote about a particular rural judge in Missouri, in St. Francis County, who was overturned by the appeals court and then the Missouri Supreme Court a couple of different times for sending people to prison uh, because they were behind on their court fines and their fees. And after I wrote those couple of columns, I started getting tips in early 2018 about other judges uh, that did this same sort of thing. Uh, and about midway through 2018, I met Matthew Mueller, who was a public defender with the Missouri State Public Defender's Office, who had been filing a series of appeals across the state related to this issue, and specifically the application of what we call in Missouri a board bill, a charge for room and board when people stay in jail. What was happening in effect was the same thing. People were going to jail for minor offenses, serving their time, and then when they got out and they couldn't afford to pay their fines and their fees and their jail board bill, they were being put back into jail again, primarily just because they were poor. And uh, Matthew Mueller used the phrase debtor's prisons uh, in some of his uh, legal briefs that he filed, and that's where we got the name. So Brooke Bergen ended up doing an entire year in jail for, uh, again, ostensibly probation violations and missing court hearings. But basically, she was put in jail for a year because she uh, shoplifted an $8 tube of mascara and then couldn't afford to pay for her time in jail. So she gets out of that year in jail, and now she has a $15,000 bill. And she's got to go back to the court month after month after month and fear more jail time if she doesn't pay down this debt that is just massive in uh, relation to her crime. And she's a woman like most of the people that I wrote about who lives in a state of poverty. She was never going to be able to, to pay that debt. And yet it, it hung on her like an albatross. So much of what I write about deals with the criminal justice system. Uh, and the silver gavel recognizes not just uh, being able to write about the criminal justice system in a meaningful way, but being able to take these complicated topics and bring them uh, to the level where average people will understand them, people that perhaps don't uh, have a connection to the legal system. And so it's a very validating award that this series is important, and it brings national attention to this problem. The 2020 Silver Gavel Award for Commentary goes to Debtor's Prison, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Accepting the Silver Gavel Award is Tony Messenger, columnist. Thank you, President Martinez, and the entire American Bar Association for this wonderful Silver Gavel Award. I hope that by honoring my columns on debtor's prisons in Missouri, this award helps bring attention to what is truly a national problem. In nearly every state in the country, there are people who go to jail because they're poor. They can't afford to pay ever-rising court fines and fees. They get a bill for their jail time and can't afford to pay that. And even though they've already served time for a misdemeanor, they are sent back to jail again. This is truly the criminalization of poverty in America, and it's happening all over the country. I hope this Silver Gavel Award serves as a call to the nation, to the attorneys in the American Bar Association, to members of the court in all different local, county, municipal, and state courts to recognize that the court system should be protecting the civil rights of those who simply can't afford to pay the court fines and fees that have become backdoor taxes forced upon the courts by state legislatures unwilling to find revenue elsewhere. Thank you again for the silver gavel. I'm honored to be 
on the stage with so many criminal justice warriors from around the country. Thank you. For documentaries, two sets of rights in one body. These seven words encapsulate the theme of the documentary, Personhood, which examines policing pregnant women in America. It presents a cautionary tale of how even well-intentioned legislation can have unintended consequences. Personhood is both disturbing and infuriating, reminding us that when fetal and maternal health are reduced to a zero-sum game, the result is the very dehumanization that the laws were intended to prevent. Let's view the trailer from Personhood and then hear from filmmaker Jo Ardinger as she discusses the genesis of this project and why Tammy Leitcher makes such an emotionally powerful film subject for viewers. There's a metal cot, there's hair, fingernails, feces on the toilet. And I would just think to myself, did I do something? Like, am I really in hell? They tell you that there's a war on women. There is no war on women. There may be a war on what's inside of women, but there is no war on women in this country. The so-called personhood bill would give embryos and fetuses all the rights and immunities of other citizens. An unborn baby would be counted in Colorado's criminal code. Similar initiatives are being considered in a dozen other states. It isn't just about abortion. It isn't just about reproductive rights. It's about whether or not, upon becoming pregnant, women lose their personhood. Your Honor, we are requesting temporary physical custody of the unborn child. The 14-week-old fetus had a lawyer at this hearing where Tammy, who had asked for a lawyer, did not have one and was denied one. Laws like these put the health of both pregnant people and their pregnancies at risk. And the idea that it would be a safe and healthy thing to do to put a woman in jail when she's pregnant is just absurd. People have no idea that this can happen to them. They wouldn't allow me to go to my OB appointments when I thought that I was having issues with possible miscarrying. They, they didn't care. I felt like my baby had more rights than I did. He has repeatedly referred to pregnant women as hosts. When I use the term host, it's not meant to uh, degrade women. Uh, I, I actually went and Googled that, and I went to Webster, and I couldn't find a better term. If the law says that the fetus that she's carrying is a person, then that means that hospitals and third parties and the state have the right to intervene on behalf of that person. When the state can do that, police can turn around and use the same law that is supposed to protect her, to prosecute her, and send her to prison for a very long time. That's what this is really about. It's about power. This is about misogyny. This is about men not being able to control the ultimate thing, life. So if I have an abortion, it would all go away? And she's like, yeah. And then I started bawling. I don't want to get rid of my baby, but you're punishing me right now for keeping him. They're like, oh, you know, you can be honest with me and nothing you say to me will have legal repercussions. That was a lie. The representative just told us that host is the best term he could find. What term would you use? Woman. I saw a news segment about a fetal personhood amendment in Mississippi, and I had never heard of anything like that. And I was just really struck by this idea that a state could give separate legal rights to fertilize eggs, embryos, and fetuses, and then what that would mean for women. And the core of our film is really about this effort to stuff two sets of rights in, in one body. and there are a lot of devastating consequences to that. In Wisconsin, um, 
they have this Unborn Child Protection Act, uh, AKA the Cocaine Mom Law. The problem with that law is that it's really prioritizing the rights of fetuses over the rights of women. And we saw that play out in Tammy Lacher's story. All of the rights that we would assume that we have, she was denied because of this law. Once she showed up at the hospital, and gave what she thought was a confidential medical history to her doctor. Behind the scenes, this law allows for any state actor to report a woman to state authorities, and this whole process gets started. If you are passing a law under the guise of protecting the fetus, then why would you send a pregnant woman to jail, which is one of the most dangerous situations she could be put in, and she was denied uh, prenatal care. So none of it really makes sense. And it all comes back to this effort to just police pregnant women. I was connected to Tammy Lacher through National Advocates for Pregnant Women. They had been working on her case. Once she understood that she could trust me with her story, she was so open to tell all of the details, this very honest portrayal of her story. And I think that's what resonates so strongly with viewers. This is a woman who did not have a lot of resources or outside support, and she really stood up to power. And she, said, this isn't right. I'm not gonna let you lock me away in inpatient drug treatment for the rest of my pregnancy because it's wrong. And she was willing to spend time in jail to protest that. And so it's just so inspiring to see her then try to take on the state of Wisconsin and challenge this entire law. The 2020 Silver Gavel Award for Documentaries goes to personhood personhood documentary, LLC, Tandy Brook Films, and Wander House. Accepting the Silver Gavel Award is Joe Ardinger, director and producer, and Rosalie Miller, producer. Thank you so much to Judy Perry Martinez and the American Bar Association for recognizing the importance of our film. Um, we are so proud of the Silver Gavel. Um, it's such an honor and we also think that it's going to help lift up a very important issue that not many people understand or know about. Um, Tammy Lacher and her story are the heart and soul of our film and she just humanizes this issue so well that we want to accept this award on behalf of Tammy and also on behalf of the thousands of women like Tammy who um, get swept up and targeted by these laws that prioritize the rights of fetal life over those of pregnant women. Um, I especially have to thank my incredible producer, Rosalie Miller, uh, who's been on this journey so long and stayed with a film that had a very tiny little budget, but did have a big mission. And I so appreciate that. I couldn't have done it without her. Um, and we also want to thank all the reproductive justice organizations that participated in the film, National Advocates for Pregnant Women, Sister Reach in Tennessee, Color in Colorado, and also Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. This project has been a grassroots effort from day one, and so we have to thank wholeheartedly our crew and our team of producers. They brought their talents to the table every day, um, and our fierce and tireless supporters who are with us from the very beginning and are still with us. And so this award is just incredibly meaningful in that we also want to use this film as a tool so we feel like this award is just going to allow us to get that much closer to our goal so that we can reach a broader audience. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. For drama and literature, Just Mercy is a fact-based film dramatization of the inspiring life and career of civil rights lawyer Brian Stevenson, portrayed by Michael B. Jordan, highlighting his legal representation of death row inmates in Alabama. Based faithfully on Stevenson's memoir of the same name, it focuses on the story of Walter McMillan, portrayed by Jamie Foxx, on death row at Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama, and his path to eventual exoneration. Moviegoers come away with deepened appreciation for the power of story in facilitating the pursuit of justice tempered with mercy. We will first watch the trailer from Just Mercy, then executive producer and movie subject, 
Brian Stevenson explains how the movie came to be and why he believes storytelling can play a vital role in sustaining our commitment to the rule of law. Tell me everything that happened. The first time I visited death row, I wasn't expecting to meet somebody the same age as me from a neighborhood just like ours. Could have been me, mama. But what you're doing is gonna make a lot of people upset. But you always taught me to fight for the people who need the help most. Your life is still meaningful, and I'm gonna do everything possible to keep them from taking it. You only know what you're into down here in Alabama when you're guilty from the moment you're born. God. Mr. McMillan. We done here. Mr. McMillan, please. I was just about to give up when I got a call from a Harvard lawyer looking to start a legal center for inmates on death row. I was in before he even offered me the job. You the lawyer? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for driving all the way out here. Most lawyers barely make time to call. I can't believe you talked to all my people and said you gonna fight for me. I did. That mean a lot. If you go digging in those wounds, you're gonna be making a lot of people very unhappy. When people care about a thing that much, they'll do anything to get what they want. When I first learned about all this, it was like looking at a river full of drowning people and not having any way of helping them. You ain't quitting, is you? No, sir. Each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. I know what it's like to be in the shadows. my dad. He do nothing wrong. It's never too late for justice. You're the only one kid enough to fight for me. If we can look at ourselves closely, we can change this world for the better. We all need grace. We all need mercy. I got my truth back. You gave that to me. And ain't nobody gonna take that from us. I've seen films based on books that I'd read, and oftentimes it, the movie loses so much, it takes away so much. I wasn't sure I wanted that to happen. And then when Michael B. Jordan and Dustin Creighton, the director, were connected to the project, I had an opportunity to talk with them. And my conversations with them began to give me some hope uh, that we could make a film that was true to the story, that was authentic, that gave voice and, and drama to these realities that I see on a regular basis. And frankly, I really want to reach people. I believe that people need to understand uh, the excess of our system, uh, the way we treat people unfairly, the way we treat people differently based on race, the way uh, we have not been holding folks accountable. Walter McMillan's story is the spine of the book, Just Mercy. It's the one story that I tell over successive chapters, multiple chapters. And I wanted his story to be the backbone of the book because it represented all of the issues that I was concerned about exploring, uh, racial inequality, the plight of the poor, the fact that we have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. I think our society, our commitment to the rule of law is deeply influenced by the narratives that we embrace. When we tell stories that undermine the value and dignity of some people because of their race, when we are told that some lives don't matter, when we're given pictures of people uh, where they're presented as uh, nothing but criminals or, or dangerous or, or, or presumptively guilty, that influences our capacity to be effective stewards, custodians of the law. And we've seen that throughout our history. We've had other films that have lifted up other issues, uh, issues that relate to the environment, issues that relate uh, to LGBT rights. And I think we need similar drama, similar storytelling to help us understand the burden that we have created uh, by mass incarceration, by excessive punishment, by wrongful convictions. And, and so I am really thrilled uh, that the ABA dedicates its uh, its uh, identity to, the, to recognizing the importance of this kind of storytelling.
The 2020 Silver Gavel Award for Drama and Literature goes to Just Mercy, Warner Brothers Pictures and Partners. Accepting the Silver Gavel Award is Brian Stevenson, executive producer and consultant. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm so honored to uh, represent the film in accepting this award from, uh, from the ABA. I'm proud of the American Bar Association's investment in recognizing storytelling. Um, we're at a critically important moment in our nation's history. Uh, for too long, uh, we have often looked the other way uh, when there is injustice, when there's inequality, when there's unfairness. I've seen that my entire career in the criminal justice system. So to shine a light on these issues and to have a movie made about these issues and then have it recognized by the ABA is deeply meaningful. I believe that there is something better waiting for us in this country. There's something that feels more like freedom, feels more like equality, feels more like justice. But to get there, we're going to have to commit to doing things that we haven't done. We're going to have to insist on ending a system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. We are going to have to insist on racial equality and racial justice. We're going to have to insist on a commitment to the rule of law that uh, does not weaken even when there are mobs, even when there's public criticism. I believe the ABA plays a critical role in achieving that goal and I appreciate your recognition of this film as a part of that effort. I want to thank everyone at Warner Media uh, for their support, all of the actors, all of the cast members, all of the directors who gave so much. Thank all of you, and we're very grateful for this recognition. Thank you so very, very much for this incredible honor, uh, the ABA Silver Gavel Award. Very moved by this. Thank you all very, very much. For newspapers, in Hidden Injustice, the resourceful Reuters Investigates news team spent almost two years digging through more than 3.2 million civil lawsuits filed over many years. They uncovered a shocking truth. Courts systemically hid evidence of dangerous consumer products. The series found that hundreds of thousands of Americans have been killed or seriously injured over the past couple of decades by allegedly defective products drugs, cars, medical devices, and other products. While evidence that could have alerted consumers and regulators to potential danger remained under seal. It led to congressional hearings and acknowledgement of the problems of court secrecy by the judiciary. Hidden injustice should be a much needed catalyst for change. Legal reporter Dan Levine discusses the series and why judges, like all government officials, should be held publicly accountable. As reporters, both myself as a legal reporter and other reporters at Reuters, we've consistently run into sealed court documents, protective orders over the years. No one would argue that a real trade secret should be secret. Um, what we were more interested in are um, details about products that could kill people and whether details about those products are being sealed without any analysis around whether they should be or not. Our first story that we published had our data findings and then it also took a deep dive into opioid litigation. With opioids, if the information had gotten out in 2001 and 2002 about how addictive um, oxycodone really was, then prescribers, patients could be armed with that information when making decisions about whether to take that drug. And it really was in the years after 2000 and 2001 that the epidemic grew to astronomical proportions and thousands of people lost their lives to overdose. And that information had been known, but it was sealed and that was sealed again before the curve of the epidemic reached where it was. And that that's just um, very troubling. After our series came out, um, Congress convened a hearing. They invited us to testify as well as a representative from the corporate side about, um, about our findings. Uh, at that hearing, Chairman Nadler of the Judiciary Committee 
uh, said he would reintroduce the Sunshine and Litigation Act, which would make it more difficult to keep discovery sealed if it involves an issue of public health and safety. Judges, and for the most part rightfully so, um, have a tremendous reputation for fairness and integrity in the country. And I think that they, just as much as people in other branches of government, also deserve scrutiny for how they do their jobs. What judges decide to do and don't do from the bench has tremendous impact on everybody in the country, not just people who are involved in a lawsuit, but whether you buy a different kind of product, whether you buy a hair loss drug, whether you are written a prescription for a painkiller, what happens in court really impacts you. And, I, and the administration of justice is a life and death issue. And I think it's really important for people to recognize that. The 2020 Silver Gavel Award for Newspapers goes to Hidden Injustice, Reuters. Accepting the Silver Gavel is Janet Roberts, data editor, and reporters Dan Levine, Lisa Garion, Benjamin Lesser, and Jamie Dowell. Thanks so much, Judy. On behalf of all of us at Reuters who worked on the Hidden Injustice Project, I'm here in Zoom land with most of the team. And I have to say of all the things UPS has delivered to my door during the COVID-19 lockdown, this beautiful silver gavel is by far the most exciting. This award is very meaningful to us because it shows that the legal profession itself agrees that court secrecy is a problem that deserves serious attention. When we first started talking about examining this issue, we encountered quite a few folks who thought we were a touch crazy they said secrecy is a normal and important function of the courts. No doubt, there are legitimate reasons for sealing information in the courts of a court case, but our team of journalists with decades of experience reporting on stories that have led us to courthouses all across America knew this was an issue of critical importance to people whose deaths or critical injuries could have been prevented had information filed secretly in court instead been made public. And our project not only showed that to be true, it quantified it. I want to take just a few seconds to thank some people, namely Steve Adler and Mike Williams at Reuters, who gave us the extraordinary gift of two years time to work on this project. That Washington Post motto, democracy dies in darkness, is true. And we are grateful that Reuters is one, of, is one news outlet that is still willing to commit extensive resources to shine light in the shadows. We'd also like to thank all of the judges, court staff, lawyers, and academics outside of Reuters, along with tireless summer interns, Nathaniel Oaken and Eric Evans, and our team programmer, Charlie Szymanski, who helped us develop and refine our methodology and ensure our findings were accurate. We hope that the ABA's recognition of our work will encourage lawyers, judges, and policymakers to continue to probe this issue and to ensure meaningful public access to our justice system. So thank you again, and congratulations to all of the other award winners. And finally, for radio. The In the Dark reporting team moved to Winona, Mississippi for a year to get to the bottom of a haunting high-stakes murder mystery. They followed the case of Curtis Flowers as he entered his third decade on Mississippi's death row. Convicted of a quadruple homicide, he always denied committing. In the dark, meticulously reinvestigated the 1996 shooting deaths at Tardy Furniture. This series is a courageously researched and compelling account of the power of unchecked prosecutors. At its end, the podcast follows Curtis Flowers in his path home to freedom. Will it hold? First, we hear a clip from an eventful day in Curtis Flowers' path home, and then host and lead reporter Madeline Barron talks about In the Dark's reporting on Flowers and why the team thinks it is so important 
to tell compelling stories that probe structural problems with our criminal justice system. Curtis's sisters were beaming. They wore black shirts with the hashtag free Curtis flowers. Curtis stopped when he got to the parking lot. Microphones and cameras clustered around him. Give you a space. Thank you, Alex. How are you feeling? How are you feeling right now? I, I feel good right now. I'm, I'm happy. I'm out uh, to be spending time with family. Uh, ooh, and, uh, looking forward to Christmas. After nearly three years of covering the case and talking to so many people who knew Curtis, I'd never actually met Curtis myself. And it turns out he was exactly as his family and friends had described. He didn't break down crying or fall to his knees on the grass. He just stood there smiling, happy to be with his family. He was just a few feet in front of me and all the other reporters. Did you think this day, what were your thoughts? Did you think this day would ever come? Oh, I knew it would, but I didn't know when. Yeah, but I always knew it would. <laughs> I, I know that, you know, your mom has passed me this time. Yes, she and has. I'm sorry. Mm. Um, could you just kind of talk about how she would look at this day a little bit? Oh, she would probably be doing flips right now. <laughs> yes. She looked forward to this. Our reporting project on Curtis Flowers started with an email from a woman who is, lives in Mississippi who said there's a man here named Curtis Flowers who's been tried six times for the same crime. And what stood out to us right away was could this possibly be true that there would be someone tried six times? And so right away, it made us interested in the power of the prosecutor. In the Dark is an investigative podcast. What the name refers to is what can happen when there is no transparency, when there's no light shown on powerful people or institutions. The story about Curtis Flowers was our second season. And what the path home is about is Curtis Flowers' path from solitary cell on death row in Parchman Prison, all the way to his family's home in Winona, Mississippi. I hope what the podcast has done is to call this issue to the public's attention, that there is very little accountability for prosecutors, even when they've been found to have engaged in racial discrimination and jury selection, uh, which is the case in the case of Curtis Flowers. Prosecutor there has been called out multiple times by various courts, including the US Supreme Court, for violating the Constitution in that particular way. It was our reporting that helped lead the US Supreme Court to grant cert in this case. The court, of course, overturned Curtis Flowers' conviction. But Curtis Flowers right now is out of jail, out of prison. He's out on bail. And Curtis Flowers is waiting to see what the Mississippi Attorney General's office will do. Our reporting really did show that almost all, all of the evidence against Curtis Flowers was flawed. A seventh trial is almost hard to imagine because there's very little evidence left in the case. We'll just see what the state decides to do. Regardless of what they decide to do, we'll be there to cover it. But it's really important for us as journalists to not just point out the problems in a you know specific criminal case or a particular story, but to tell these broader stories, like these structural problems in our criminal justice system that go well beyond one case. That is the through line from Curtis Flowers' case from start to finish. So this is not unique to Curtis Flowers, whether it's junk science, whether it's racism in the criminal justice system, whether it's the abuse of power wielded by one prosecutor. These are problems that occur, of course, as we all know, throughout our criminal justice system. And so I think that that's, that's really why we do this work as investigative reporters. The 2020 Silver Gavel Award for Radio goes to In the Dark, Season 2, The Path Home, American Public Media. Accepting the Silver Gavel, is Samira Freemark, Managing Producer. Thank you so much for recognizing In the Dark with the Silver Gavel Award. We are incredibly honored to receive this award and to be in the company of all of the other winners. It's particularly gratifying to be honored with this award right now at this moment. In the Dark's second season was about a black man named Curtis Flowers who had been tried six times for the same crime by the same white prosecutor. It's a story about what can happen when the power of a prosecutor goes unchecked, but it's also a story about race and racism in the criminal justice system. We feel so lucky that we were given the time and resources we needed to tell this important and highly complex story. Um, and thank you for recognizing its value. In the Dark is a team effort. It's made by a whole group of people. Uh, the project would not be possible without them. And so from all of us at In the Dark, thank you to the Silver, Silver Gavel Awards for recognizing our work. We appreciate it so much. I would like to add my personal congratulations to the honorees and my appreciation for all that they have done 
to further the public's understanding of law. I would also like to thank the 18 members of the Standing Committee on Silver Gavel Awards and the 48 members of its Screening Committee for their dedication in judging the entries. I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker, Jonathan Capehart, and would like to especially thank Standing Committee on Gavel Awards member Tom Pro for his role in arranging Mr. Capehart's participation today. Jonathan Capehart is an opinion columnist, host of the Cape Up podcast, and member of the editorial board of the Washington Post. He focuses on the intersection of social and cultural issues in politics. A Pulitzer Prize winner for editorial writing, he is also a contributor on MSNBC and a frequent presence on television, radio, and social media with more than 377,000 followers on Twitter at CapeArtJ. Joining us now is Jonathan Capehart. Good evening. Many thanks to the American Bar Association for the honor of speaking at this year's Silver Gavel Awards. While the pandemic prevents us from being together as planned at the National Press Club here at Washington, I'm happy that modern technology makes it possible for us to see each other virtually and to celebrate tonight the work and the artists, advocates, journalists, and activists who made that work possible. This year, given all that is happening in our country today, the Silver Gavel Awards take on added meaning. On May 25th, George Floyd lay on a Minneapolis street with the knee of Officer Derek Chauvin pressed to his neck. Because of bystander video, we watched eight minutes and 46 seconds of horror. We heard Floyd's pleas of, I can't breathe, his calling out for his long deceased mother. We watched that officer rest his weight on Floyd's neck as he fought for his life and long after he lost it. The outrage was swift and it was national. From small towns to America's largest cities, people demanded justice. They demanded reform. And the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Rayshard Brooks and Ahmaud Arbery and so many other unarmed African Americans has led to the kind of soul searching this nation probably hasn't undertaken since Bloody Sunday in 1965. Americans are looking at their country in a new light. They are seeing inequities and injustices, some for the very first time, or appreciating their seriousness for the first time. But as the work of tonight's recipients of the Silver Gavel Award attest, some of the seeds of today's protests were planted before the founding of our republic seeds soaked in a toxic brine of patrimony and white supremacy that sprouted into laws and customs that haunt us to this very day. Personhood, the Silver Gavel awardee for documentaries, shows the lengths the state will go to, as they claim, protect life, giving fetuses the rights of personhood while denying their mothers the fundamental right to protect their own life or have autonomy over their own bodies. The silver gavels for books, for drama and literature, and for commentary show how broken our criminal justice system is, and how it exacerbates racial disparities within it, and how it can easily send the innocent to prison, and how difficult it is to get them out. Tony Messenger of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch devoted column after column to the criminalization of poverty through debtors' prisons. Emily Bazelon wrote an entire book on the power of prosecutors and their role in perpetuating the mass incarceration of black men. In the Dark from American Public Media showed the power of one specific prosecutor over the life of one man, trying him six times for the same crime over the span of 20 years. The Warner Brothers movie, Just Mercy, showed the unwillingness of the system to set the innocent free despite evidence that demands it. And Reuters, 
the Silver Gavel for Newspapers awardee, showed what happens when judges turn their courtrooms into vaults where corporate secrets are kept from the public to the detriment of the public. And yet all of these works point to people doing everything they can to right wrongs, to bring balance back to the scales of justice, to ensure that her blindfold is firmly in place to deliver impartial justice without fear or favor of those with wealth and power, especially at the expense of those who have neither, and to setting the innocent free. All of this year's awardees have highlighted deficiencies in the American experiment and the role of the law in them. But they've also shown the role of the law in bringing our nation closer to the grand ideals espoused in our founding documents and that are woven into our national DNA. On March 7, 1965, Americans were sitting in their living rooms. They were watching Judgment at Nuremberg on ABC when a special report broke into programming to show what happened to fellow Americans on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. Marchers were beaten with billy clubs, tear gas, and chased back over the bridge, all because they wanted the law changed, all because they wanted to vote. They believed in the words of our Constitution. They believed in the rule of law. They wanted the words etched over the entrance to the Supreme Court to apply fully and equally to them, equal justice under law. The horror that unfolded that night led to, a, to national action that resulted in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to be signed into law five months later, 55 years ago next month. The American people are marching again. They are fighting for justice en masse again. And the Silver Gavel awardees of 2020 have added to our collective understanding of what's broken, what needs fixing, and how best we can go about making this a more perfect union. Congratulations to the awardees, and thank you, American Bar Association, for your vital work and the honor of speaking tonight. Jonathan, thank you for your engaging and inspiring remarks. I also want to thank all of you for joining us for this virtual 2020 awards presentation. This video will continue to be available along with other program materials at ambar.org slash gavel awards. Please stay safe and be well.